G'day, this is Alex Bainbridge. Welcome to The Green Left Show. The US Deputy Secretary of State, Kurt Campbell, has openly said that Australia's AUKUS submarines would be used in war against China. This is what we'll talk about today. Before we get underway, I do want to acknowledge that this broadcast is happening on stolen Aboriginal land and at a time when we can see the horrors of what real-life colonialism means in the, in the context of Israel's genocide in Gaza, it is more important than ever that we express solidarity with First Nations people in this country and around the world. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. The other thing I wanted to say before we get underway, you might have noticed that Facebook has uh, unpublished, in other words, censored, the Green Left Facebook page. This makes it more important than ever for people that like the work that we do to please become a supporter. Sign up at greenleft.org.au slash support. I'm here today with Sam Wainwright, who's a one of the national co-conveners of Socialist Alliance and a, an active member in Stop AUKUS WA. Now, Socialist Alliance has consistently opposed Australia's involvement in this AUKUS military gang because it implies even closer association with aggressive US imperialism, including the, the threat of war against China. Also, it's a massive misallocation of social resources. $368 billion, just to start with, inevitably it'll, it'll become much more than that, uh, spent on nuclear submarines. That money should instead be going to things like climate action, public housing, just to name a few examples. Now, the Deputy Secretary of State in the US has openly come out and said that Australia's AUKUS submarines would be used in war against China. I'm wondering, Sam, if you could just begin by explaining what is your response to this latest development? Yes, look, his address was actually uh, quite revealing uh, because it confirmed essentially what we in the anti-war movement have been saying right from the outset, that this, the AUKUS deal is part of situating Australia within an essentially offensive, aggressive posture towards China. So there were three, I think there were three notable things we can draw from, from, from his, his comments. The first, as you say, was that he explicitly tied the AUKUS submarines to conflict with China in, in, in the Straits of Taiwan. Um, now, our media in Australia keeps reporting this as a potential Chinese invasion of, of Taiwan. Uh, but let's be quite clear, it could, it, 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 it could be any kind of confrontation. In fact, you know, with the, the intensity with, with which the United States is trying to encircle China militarily, a whole sort of arc, uh, arc on China's east. Um, it's just as likely that China will, uh, that the United States will actually try to provoke a conflict with China uh, in the Taiwan Straits, and then claim that that is China trying to invade Taiwan. Who knows? You know. Um, uh, I mean, I should be clear from the outset that us in Socialist Alliance, we don't think China should try to uh, take Taiwan by force. Uh, and the Taiwanese people have a right to self determination. But I think it's very naive to assume that any conflict will be because China tries to tries to take Taiwan by force. Um, I think it's just as likely that the United States will try to provoke a conflict with China in the Taiwan Straits. So that's the first thing. Uh, and I mean, I think that was obvious to all of us from the outset anyway, even though Australian politicians kind of sat on the fence and evaded the question. But, you know, these are the whole purpose of these sub submarines is both they are long range submarines. And secondly, they have a long range weapons delivery capacity. Um, and, you know, early on in the piece, we had Australian politicians talking about, oh, protecting Australia's, you know, maritime trade routes in the South China Sea. And it's what, like, it just posed the obvious question, why would China attack the trade routes with Australia? You know, like, it's, it serves no, you know, it's just it was logical nonsense, you know. Um, so that's, that, that's the first thing. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's the first and most scary thing, quite, you know, quite, quite, quite honestly. And the second thing flows from that is that he made it fairly clear that, uh, the United States, if, if the United States were involved in such a conflict, it would be expecting to recruit those submarines to the operation. So all this, you know, there once again, there was this sort of evasive bluff and bluster about Australia um, retaining sovereign control over these submarines. And Campbell's made it pretty clear that the United States is not going to be transferring this kind of technology to Australia um, for Australia then to choose when and if it uses it. No, uh, this it's, it's entirely expected that these submarines would be integrated into US strategic military planning. So, it, you know, if the US goes to war, uh, we go to war. Uh, that's, you know, he made that pretty, 
pretty, pretty damn clear. And the third thing, which I think was a bit of a wake up call um, for the union movement in particular, was that he chastised both the Albanese government and even Biden himself for talking up this thing about, you know, well paid union manufacturing jobs that, that the submarine program uh, was, was, going to, was, going to, was going to deliver. I mean, we should say that the number of jobs that's being talked about from an Australian perspective are, are just minuscule. Um, I mean, we, we, we hear about, say, perhaps 20,000 jobs, you know, maybe eight to 10,000 manufacturing jobs in, in Adelaide, where there would be assembly of the submarines and then others scattered around the country. And of course, in a context like Australia, where there is there's a shortage of manufacturing jobs, you know, we've seen manufacturing jobs gone overseas, all that sort of stuff. 20,000 can seem like a lot. But stacked up against the 368 billion and counting for AUKUS, it's minuscule. You know, I mean, we're literally uh, look back a year ago. I did I did a rough calculation, so someone someone might correct me in the comments. But from memory, it's like 16 to 18 million dollars per job. I mean, it's the most it's the most least efficient job creation in the history of anything. You know, um, you, you know, you could pay a hundred times as many people just to you know to, 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 to sit to sit at home and do nothing let alone what you said in your introduction, that you could actually pay people to do socially useful things, um, health, education, repair the environment. The list goes on. We've all got our own list of the things that we could spend that $368 billion on. So, uh, you know, I think that should, that should, that sound, you know, he, he basically said, you know, our leaders should stop talking about this as a jobs creation program. And fundamentally, it's a military strategic program. So really, his bluntness of language just cut across all the sort of bluff and bluster and evasion and fence sitting that our politicians in Australia have used to justify justify the AUKUS program. Um, so that's a big wake up call um, and a validation of what we've been saying right from the outset. Much of the commentary in the mainstream media has focused on the question of the delays, uh, whether Australia will even get these Virginia class submarines as a stopgap measure between before the AUKUS submarines. Uh, the debates in the US Congress. I'm wondering, Sam, if you could comment about those things. Well, sure. I mean, who knows whether we'll actually get the submarines. I mean, in terms of job creation, of course, you know, primarily it's a boost to the US and British shipbuilding industries. Um, it's pumping a hell of a lot of Australian taxpayers' money into uh, propping up a section of British and American capitalism, first and foremost. Um, so we, we, you know, we, we have to hand over the money, no matter whether the sub submarines, you know, Come late or come at all. Um, so even even if you think that Australia needs needs all these submarines, which I don't, um, but it's you know that's there's, there's still that question mark over it. The um, the, the the US program at the moment, you know, as 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 you pointed out, the the Virginia class submarines are supposed to be the stop stopgap submarines while we're waiting for the AUKUS submarines to arrive. So even within the framework of you know defence industry specialists and that sort of stuff, there's criticism of that because you know you know, sort of tooling up and training up a workforce to, for, for two different kinds of submarines has its own inefficiencies and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, we'll, and the Americans aren't actually projecting to build enough Virginia class submarines to lend us a couple anyway, you know, so all that's, all that's in the mix, right? Um, as, 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 as part of the thing. But the thing that's really concerning, of course, is that, uh, it's not AUKUS is, never, is not just about the submarines. So you know, the submarines are a pillar one of AUKUS. And pillar two is all the other stuff. That's the um, the interoperability of military forces. It's the intelligence sharing. It's the cooperation around all the new, you know, fair forms of cyber war warfare and drones and all that sort of stuff. And um, shared access to Australian military bases, you know, which was already already set and trained by the, the so called fourth posture agreement. So all that stuff rolls on, you know, regardless of of of, of whether the submarines come late or come at all, um, which we still pay for. And I think that's the thing which we, and that, that, get, that gets us back to the original point of that, that AUKUS is about an aggressive posture um, towards China, not defending poor little Australia from China. It's about recruiting Australia to a very aggressive and deliberate strategy of the United States, which is to so-called contain China and contain it by force if necessary. Now, the United States has decided that it's all good and well for China to industrialize up to a certain point uh, by subcontract subcontracting a whole lot of manufacturing, the more dirty, polluting, less lucrative streams of manufacturing gets, you know, um, offshored, gets sent from from, 
you know, the United States and the global north to China. They're, they're happy enough for, for China to, to industrialize up to a certain point uh, through that process because that makes more money for, for Western corporations as well. Uh, but, you know, the Chinese ruling elite um, is not, you know, is not a child of, you know, of, of, of Western colonialism. You know, it's it, it's a product of of of, of, of Chinese revolution. So they ne- they've never been you know dependent on or complete, utterly sub- politically subordinate to the West. You know, and so so you know the, the 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 leadership in China has its own vision of of continuing this industrialization of China and catching up to the West. You know, which they've done in certain sectors. They haven't done it across the totality of their economy. And so people should you know not lose sight of that. You know, when, often we think about China, we think about you know the very modern cities on the East Coast like Shanghai, that sort of stuff, but you know, um, labor productivity in China is still about twenty five percent of of, the, of of what it is in the West, right? But um, um, but nonetheless, they that you know they don't want China to catch up. Um, not in you know um, the, and and the United States has made that very clear. You know, it's you can make our washing machines, um, but you're not going to have semiconductor a semiconductor industry. I mean, that, that's the one they're very focused on. They've basically said. It's now U.S. policy to block China from acquiring the capacity to make semiconductors. Um, and if you're an American citizen or a, or a U.S. resident, even um, it's it, it's it's now um, against the law um, to even work for Ch- for a Chinese company that's involved in semiconductors, that sort of stuff. So there, the United States has made it very clear: no, China is not going to catch up to the West, and we are prepared to use sanctions um and espionage and even military force to stop it stop it from happening china is not going to catch up politically industrially um militarily to the west and i think this 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 kurt campbell i mean he's been uh pretty blunt before so i'll just i'll just share with you um uh something that he actually said this is privately to eu officials back in 2022 uh, and he said that part of the purpose of AUKUS um quote is getting australia off the fence we have them locked in now for the next 40 years. Now, for an Australian, you might think, what, what's this about, talk about Australia being on the fence, you know? I mean, Australia, uh, the Australia ruling elite normally falls over itself to join US military um, expeditions overseas, where, you know, from Vietnam to Afghanistan to Iraq, you know, Australia's there sort of, um, you know, like the little um, tagging along with the, with, the, with the schoolyard bully, you know? Um, Trying to ingratiate itself and, and offering offering to send troops to help to help the United States before we're even asked. Uh, but I think what he's talking about here is China very specifically, because Australian capitalism does has a certain does, there's a there's a there's a quite a stark contradiction for for Australian capitalism um, in joining this campaign to isolate China. I mean, this campaign for the United States and, and Britain as well, but it's sharper for Australia. That is just the scale of Australian trade to China. China is now our biggest. Um, export source of exports and source of imports. So it's a, our, our biggest trading partner on both fronts. And so there's a certain contradiction for Australian capitalism. Uh, why would you be seeking a mil- to join a military alliance against your biggest trading partner? And and that you know that's had its reflection in the in the in the in the really um, uh, fierce criticism of AUKUS that Paul Keating, former Prime Minister Paul Keating, has raised. You know because he has a vision for an Australian capitalism. That's relatively independent. I mean, you go think about it. Australia is a mid-sized imperialist power in its own right. There are actually no threats to invade Australia. There is no country in our midst that has the means or 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 um, you know incentive to to invade Australia or attack Australia or encircle Australia or anything like that. So it's quite it's quite feasible that Australian capitalism could say, well, look, you know, let's just let's just have the best of both worlds and trade with both China and the United States on our own terms. We don't need to. We don't need to pick sides. We'll just do what we need to do. That seems to me to be Paul Keating's vision, you know, for a bold, you know, Asian Australian capitalism, you know, as you know, and you know, back in the 1990s when he was sort of more advancing that kind of vision. That's why he was very big on you know teaching Asian languages in schools and and all that sort of stuff. And so, I look, I don't know how much, you know, h- how much of the Australian elite, you know, both sort of senior policy makers and big capitalists themselves actually should share Paul Keating's vision or not, you know. Um, but 
it seems that a decisive majority have fallen in behind the AUKUS line, um, including the costs and contradictions that come with that. And we've seen that in this savagey bargy over trade and that sort of stuff. I mean, China has recently um, slackened some of the, the tariffs that it whacked on you know, Australian Australian produce like wine and, and other agricultural stuff. So, you know, Australian producers of those things are celebrating a little bit, but but the contradiction surely hasn't been resolved and the contradiction for Australian capitalism hasn't been involved. And it seems to me that Australian, you know, Australian capitalism and Australian politicians actually want the best of both worlds. They want to be able to, you know, keep selling all this stuff to China, um, but also join this U- US military alliance against China. And of course, it's, you know, surely that contradiction is, is, is going to crack somehow, but uh, but we'll see. I mean, in the meantime, the important thing for us as people who actually have a uh, a vision for a peaceful future, a sustainable future, um, is to is is to continue opposing this AUKUS alliance and you know seize on the words of of, of Kurt Campbell to to to, sh- to tell to show Australians why this this path of AUKUS is absolute madness. I mean, not only is it just a phenomenal amount of money, three hundred sixty eight billion dollars and counting, and Campbell himself flagged the fact that it will, that, that, we, that you know it, it will sh- surely need more money. Um, but just more fundamentally, um, we do face an existential crisis, a threat to our safety and livelihood and well-being, and that, that's runaway global warming. And it is, I mean, it's utterly inconceivable that you could be, um, you know, pouring this sort of money into arming for a new Cold War and confront the challenge of global warming. You can't do both at the same time. In fact, the choice to fund AUKUS is, a dece- is the response to global warming of our ruling elite. We should understand this. You know, sometimes some climate activists say, oh, you know, you know, Labor Party, Liberal Party, ruling, you know, ruling elite in Australia, senior policy, they don't understand the threat of climate change. They do understand the threat of climate change. But what AUKUS demonstrates is their response is going to be repression and war. That's what their response is. Um, there are two choices. It's the AUKUS response or it's we actually try to 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 um, take genuine efforts to to slow down and then turn around global warming and meet the challenges of global warming in a way that that centers justice and democracy that the you know, AUKUS really creates two stark choices for us and I think climate activists need to understand that climate activists need to understand that in part combating climate change starts with derailing AUKUS. In addition to the nuclear submarines the Liberal opposition leader Peter Dutton is making a big push for Australia to go nuclear with what is called the so-called misnamed small modular reactors. I'm wondering, Sam, do you think this is related to the AUKUS push or is this a independent, um, an independent move by the, by the Liberal opposition? Look, I, I, I don't, I don't ab- know for certain. I think it, it seems to be independent. You know, the Labor Party is obviously not on board with it. I mean, in the short term, it kind of ser- almost serves a useful role in the pantomime of, of, of Australian politics, you know. Um, uh, Dutton can float this idea of small, mo- so-called small modular reactors, uh, and then the Labor Party can say, oh, no, we're against that. That's terrible. We don't need, you know, we don't need nu- nuclear reactors in Australia, you know. Um, and, you know, it, almost, it sort of gives them the space to be, um, appear like the progressives in the face of the unreasonable Dutton who wants who, who wants nuclear reactors, but these small nuclear reactors, you know. Um and you know, and 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 if, if we all think that then becomes the main game, we actually, th- we, you know, we forget about AUKUS itself. You know, I mean, thanks to AUKUS, I mean, and this is already had it happening under the Force Posture Agreement anyway, um, with the increased rotation of nuclear submarine visits to Western Australia in particular, where I live, um, we've already got nuclear reactors um, adjacent to our cities. Uh, they, they, they're sitting at Garden Island in Coburn Sound, off the coast of Perth. Um, so, you know, and it, with, with each reactor having many times more um, ra- uh, radioactive material than each bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that's the first thing. And then the second thing is there, there will be the low, the medium level reactive wa- uh, radioactive waste from the reactors on those submarines, which we, we still don't know where that's going to go. Um, so, you know, you know, if, if, if you're concerned about... Um, you know that, that that that's the nuclear threat that is that 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 is immediately made present, which the Labor Party has signed up to. That said, of course, you know, of course, we need to oppose these um this idea that that somehow small modular you know re- reactors are, are are necessary in the Australian energy mix. It's it's been clear for a long time uh, that Australia has the capacity to provide um, 
base load power for stationary electricity production from from renewables and has been for a long time. So in that sense, they are just a, 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 a loopy distraction from Dutton. So it serves that purpose. But, you know, I, I, I dare say there's something genuine about it for Dutton as well. You know, I mean, he does he, he, he does want an energy future where we need to keep buying the energy input from from a mining company. Um, not get it from the uh, not get it from the sun or the sea or the or, or, or the wind. So yeah, look, I think we of course we need to um, knock the idea of these small modular reactors on the head without without losing sight of the bigger picture. You mentioned imperialist aggression, and I think this is perhaps no better exemplified than the open U.S. support for Israel's genocide against the people of Gaza. Australian government has also been openly supporting this genocide, although perhaps in recent times has become a little bit shamefaced about it, making some words or some noises that seem to imply opposition without actually taking the actions that you would expect if they actually opposed the genocide. In addition, last week we saw the slaughter by Israel, the targeted slaughter, of seven international aid workers, including an Australian citizen, which has provoked a dramatic outcry of opposition around the world. I'm wondering, Sam, do you see this as a turning point? And would you like to make any other comments about this Israeli genocide? Look, I think we should seek to make it a turning point. You know, that's that's the really that's the really important thing here. Uh, so, you know, we know there's no, absolutely no question whatsoever that the, that the, the Israeli army knew that they were targeting an aid convoy that you know that was clearly labelled and given their coordinates and and all and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, I think it's also quite likely that not only did the Israelis know that it was an aid convoy, uh, but they also they knew that there were foreigners in that aid convoy. And furthermore, they precisely hoped that by carrying out this attack, there'd be a bit of blowback. Um, they'd cop a, you know, it would damage their reputation a bit in the West in particular. I mean, I don't think that, you know, Israel's got no kind of reputation in the global South, but in the West, it would particularly... Um, damage their reputation, but that they would be able to withstand that blowback and that it would actually cause all aid agencies just to remove themselves from Gaza. So they so there'd be no independent witness to what they're doing, um, no handbrake at all, uh, and there'd be no no and fundamentally no food aid getting to Palestinians, which is their objective. You know, I mean this is a, a, a programmed genocide. So in I I think, you know, Exactly how much that that was planned and how how far it you know went up the sort of command structure you know within the IDF you know up the Netanyahu himself I don't you know I don't know the answer to that question but I think but in any case I would say that Israelis have miscalculated uh, I think the blowback is more than what they expected and and we and we need to turn it into a turning point so you know one of our visceral reactions as as people who support the rights of the Palestinians to, is to have a certain disgust and frustration at our own government and media. Um, sort of noticing um, that the Israelis are attacking um, aid workers uh, when they happen to be um, uh, Westerners, um, but that's and you know and when of course you know 196 um, aid workers have already been killed by Israel, um, uh, you know up to that point, and of course then there's the 32,000 Palestinians that we know have been killed approximately, and another 10,000 almost certainly buried in the rubble, but. We, but nonetheless, we need to, we, we need to capture that moment um, and and really turn it against uh, turn it against Israel's um, w- w- war machine and, and and all the propaganda in support of it. And so I think I think it does off, offer this potential to be a turning point. You know, certainly, we see it rhetoric. You're right. Um, the change from Western leaders has only been rhetorical so far, um, and you know, and that's because strategically they support Israel. Uh, Israel's fundamental function as in the in the language of the US themselves, as our unsinkable aircraft carrier in the Middle East, they remain wedded to that. There's no question about that. That's not to say there isn't, for instance, some uh there isn't tactical disagreement with Israel. I think you know there's general this 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 genuine tactical disagreement with Israel. I think I think Western leaders would actually like Israel to tone it down a little bit, you know. They they certainly wish the Israeli leadership hadn't used explicitly genocidal language um, when when launching their invasion of Gaza. But the point is that's that's what Israel is. You know, they've created this monster. Uh, Israel isn't just a simple puppet of the United States. It's a real society with its own internal dynamics and its own ruling class. Um, and to 
to whip a society up into this kind of genocidal mania uh, for, and, and supporting the this this um, wholesale destruction of Gaza, you know, you, you, know, you, you need to do what they you, know, you, you need that kind of language and everything that's preceded it, you know. So that I mean, in that sense, the Western leaders find themselves caught by a, by a, um, a monster of their own making, you know. Um, but yes, as you say, so far they have, even though the the, the hand wringing has got a bit more visible and the words of concern have got a bit louder. And, and it reflects both the fact that, as I said, I think there is a bit of a tactical difference there. And also they are feeling pressure, most importantly, from from, from the population um, in, 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 in countries like Australia. You know, uh, and opinion polls demonstrate demonstrate that. But they, as you say, they haven't actually done anything concrete to hurt Israel. There's still been no... But beyond rhetoric, there has still been no consequences for Israel. Now, we're, you know, from the United States now, we are getting some Democrat senators um, starting to talk about um, restrictions on a sale of offensive weapons to Israel. Um, but so far, you know, it's still only talk, you know. So, um, I mean, you think it from the point of view of, of Netanyahu. I mean, if your enemy is, if, if you're standing on your enemy's throat and putting a gun at their head, why do you need to compromise? Why do you, there's nothing, you know, um, why do you need to talk peace or compromise? You know, so, you know, it, it's clear that is, the Israeli leadership will not dial things back even a bit um, unless and until there are real consequences. And I think that's that kind of centres our focus as people who support justice and human rights in Palestine, Israel, uh, here in Australia. And so that is what can we get the Australian government to do that would make a real difference to the situation? And I think, uh, I mean, the call of our movement is obviously just cut ties with, with apartheid Israel. And I think, I think the sharp edge of that is is end all military cooperation with Israel, um, because as you know, most, as as you would know, uh, you know, the Australian government actually announced the nine hundred and seventeen million dollar deal to buy defence equipment from Elbert Systems after the ICJ ruling, after it, for heaven's sake. So that was, um, I mean, to, to pump $917 million of Australian taxpayers' money into the Israeli industrial military complex in the wake of the ICJ ruling, I mean, that was like a green light to Netanyahu to keep keep keep, keep doing what you're doing, you know? Um, the strategic partnership is fine. So I think we've really got to, we've really got to pump that to the, to the fore. Uh, so we can say that people like Penny Wong, you know, who was falling over herself to lay flowers, you know, at a at a uh, memorial for you know um, killed aid workers, um, to say, look, you know, we 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 judge you by what you do, not what you say. Um, cut the deal with Elbert. Cut all bilateral military ties with Israel. I think that has to be front and center of our of our push. You know, we, we've got to seize we've got to seize on this moment created by this 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 ghastly murder of the seven aid workers and couple that with 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 Australian sentiment. According to YouGov polls, and they're already a few weeks old now, um 81% of Australians support a ceasefire and 54% think the Australian government should do more to achieve that ceasefire. Um, so we need we we need, and that that may have you know that, that may even be more now. And so we need to but there's still a layer of Australians who who would think, oh but you know the government says they support a ceasefire. They are doing something, aren't they? You know, and for those people who don't realise that, no, in practice, the Australian government is, is materially assisting the genocide. And so we've got to we've got to connect those people with the fact to create to create strong stronger pressure. Obviously, AUKUS should be opposed on its own terms, but Australia should be speaking out not only against Israel's genocide but the US direct complicity in this genocide. Surely, this is yet another argument against Australia signing up to AUKUS and allying with the United States. Do you have any comments about that? Well, yes. I mean, I'm, I think the thing about AUKUS is, yeah, it's not just about the submarine. It's about locking Australia in um, with, you know, what you might call an Anglo-imperialist alliance, you know, which has been expressed, was expressed in the in, um, invasion of Iraq. Um, it's expressed in AUKUS. It's also expressed in the Five, Five Eyes Agreement. So there's this uh, fairly, I mean, there's already this pretty tight, um, interconnected, um, what I call ang Anglo-imperialist alliance, you know, and that doesn't just flow from sort of a, a shared cultural um, experiences, although that that's kind of part of it, you know, this sort of sense that we're like the Brits and the Americans, that sort of stuff, which is part of the kind of 
quite imperial of brainwashing that you get in, in in our countries. But it has a material basis as well. You know, like uh, Australia is, you know, for for, for all the all the um, you know scare you get about you know China taking over Australia. I mean, the biggest source of foreign direct investment in Australia is British and US capitalism, and the biggest destination for Australian foreign direct investment is 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 the United States and, and Britain. So this there are that you know there are this sort of um this overlapping um in interconnection between Australian capitalism and the other sort of Anglo imperialist countries. As we discussed before, it has that certain contradiction that Australia Australia has this greater trade with China. Um, but your AUKUS is really about cementing that in. And if you know if you're locked into AUKUS, then we're not going to be in a position to, to criticise anything else that the United States does anywhere else in the world, and 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 including in, in, including including support for Israel, so it makes it very clear. We just we 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 need to we need to break the alliance. This because uh, not just about our AUKUS, it's about ANZUS and our whole interconnection with this offensive U.S. military machinery. Thanks for your time today, Sam. Okay, thanks very much, and thank you for joining us on the Green F Show. If you've got concerns about Australian submarines being used in war against China. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Please remember, if you like the work that we do, please become a Green F supporter. It's the number one way to both support our work and to get the content that we produce. You can also support us on patreon.com and there's a link in the description below. And without spending a cent, you can share this video or share this podcast and give it a thumbs up and tell your friends about the Green F show. We love to have your support. Thanks for your company. We'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.